Hey guys, welcome to 180 Briefs. Have you been outside at all? With the exception of maybe a couple of stormy days, but a day like today, it is gorgeous. Just looking around, seeing the flowers all coming up, seeing the everything turning green, um, people getting out, the kids playing in the street. Some of them are needing to relearn to look both ways before they come running across the street. Um, have you gotten to meet your neighbors? I know it's a little hard when you have to stay your distance and you can't touch each other, but have you been seeing what the new world is like with meeting everybody and people so excited to see another human being that they're more talkative? Inviting you over to their driveway and set a chair up and just hang out see each other's face and talk. People walking their dogs. Our, sub, our subdivision has about I guess 150 houses and at, originally I thought we knew a lot of them but ever th since COVID you see so many people walking now and you're like well where do they live? I haven't seen them before. Where does that one live? I don't remember them. Do, they, do we have guests? Um, but it's interesting, getting to know people. I was really getting to know people before all this. Uh, several of our neighbors I've talked with. Um, we walk our dogs together. And it's been very interesting to get to know of them. Sadly, a couple of them have passed away. Uh, nothing to do with COVID. They actually passed away right, right before. Which, I don't know if maybe that was a blessing. I don't know. But it's just interesting to get to know them, uh, hear their stories. So I'm encouraging you to get out, get to know people. Uh, because when everything goes back to the new norm, we might not have these times where we can share and spend time with each other, get to know each other. Um, maybe you're not in a place where you can say, hey, can I pray for you? But now that you know their story, now that you know their name, um, you can, as you do your walk, stop at their mailbox and pray for them. I don't know. Just something to think about. want to thank you for joining us at 180 Briefs. My neighbor just fired up his lawnmower just in time. Um, uh, but we got Pastor Eddie tonight uh, speaking for us. A little uh, preview of what he's going to be doing for next week uh, morning service. So glad you're here. Glad that I could pretend to see your faces. Uh, those of you that are visiting 180 for the first time, uh, thanks for showing up. I know we've been having lots of guests that aren't uh, normal 180 attendees um, just by looking at the view count of how many have been showing up. Uh, so, again, thanks for coming. For those of you who've been asking about tithes and offerings, you can go to AdventistGiving.net. And it's pretty simple. It's just like an electronic version of a tithe envelope. And you could just fill it out and give, you know, whether it's a credit card or your debit card and choose what you want the money to go towards. So it's essentially the same thing, just a little bit different. Uh, but pretty easy. Once you get on there, you'll understand what to do. Um, no announcements. You can use my phone number, 630-453-9112. You can call me. You can text me if you've got any prayer requests. Uh, if you want the prayer teams to get at it, just let me know, and I will forward your messages. Uh, but on that, uh, glad everything is technology advanced that we can still somehow spend a little time with each other. So, thanks for coming.
such a wonderful place, accused and condemned, we find mercy and grace. Hello, church family, and welcome once again to the Hinsdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. As you can see, we are still in lockdown mode. I miss you guys. I can't wait to see this church filled again with your presence. I trust that you've had a good week and that God has kept you safe and your family well. This morning, before I share a few thoughts with you, I'd like to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, this morning, I recognize that we are not here to listen to me. We are here to listen to you. And so today, I want to pray that, Lord, you would empty me of everything that is me and fill me with everything that is you. Today, as we learn a little bit more about you, we may learn to love you more. This is our prayer. In God's name we ask. Amen. You know, this past week, I was talking to a fellow Christian who, like most of us, is concerned about the future of our church, our country, our world, our family. This person asked me questions that we have all been asking ourselves over the last several weeks. Like, how are we going to get through this coronavirus pandemic? What are we going to do? Will we ever be allowed to come back to church again? And, last but not least, what is life going to look like once we do come back? And you know, every time someone asks me one of those questions, or I start to think about those questions, a song comes to mind. Can you guess the song? Let me share a little piece of it with you. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God 
Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. Here in this chapter and in this verse, God declared the following. What I have said, that will I bring about. And what I have planned, that will I do. And God, and again, God said, Surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have promised, so it will stand. You know, God stands on His promises. And God's people in the Old Testament learned to rely on those promises. Maybe that's why the writer of Psalm 119 put it this way. Your promises have been thoroughly tested and your servant loves them. David also echoed these words in Psalm 145, 13, when he said, the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. You know, as you read these verses, one thing that I notice is that they weren't nagging God. They were telling God, God, you said this is what you would do if we believe. We believe it. And now we're watching to see what you'll do. And sure enough, for those of us that have read the Bible, we know that God would answer their prayers. Now, that's what happened in the Old Testament. But something interesting happens in the New Testament. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. God says something interesting. But now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Did you catch it? <laughs> God tells us that no matter what promises God made in the Old Testament, the ministry Jesus has received is founded on better promises. Better promises, you say? Yes. In fact, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the following. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So you see, Jesus has given us better promises than those the Old Testament saints received. And these promises in the Bible, the Bible says, gives us everything we need for life and godliness. In fact, these promises are so much better that they have, they even help us, as the Bible said, participate in the divine nature and they help us escape the corruption of this world. I don't know about you, but regardless of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative, we live in a corrupt world. Everywhere we turn, we see evidence of that. It doesn't matter whether it's as far as Washington, D.C. or as close as the neighborhoods that we live in. We need better promises. But what kind of promises does what kind of promises did Jesus give us that are better promises? Well, let me suggest this morning three of the most important ones are found right here in the first chapter of Acts. These three better promises, let me suggest, are foundational. Why? 
because I believe that they are central to our faith. Why do I say that? Simple. Because without these three promises, the teachings of our faith would be no different than those of other religions. So, what are these three promises of Jesus, you ask? Here they are. Number one, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the promise of power through the Holy Spirit. And number three, the promise that Jesus will return to take us to heaven. So, let's take them one at a time. The first promise is the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, we find this promise. Turn there with me. Jesus said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So question, what prophecy was Jesus referring to here? Do you know? Sure you do. Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. It says, And afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit on those days. If you recall, this promise found in Joel chapter 2 was powerfully displayed about 10 days later at the Feast of the Pentecost. The Bible tells us that the apostles were meeting together in an upper room and the sound of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the room where they were. It goes on to say that something like tongues of fire came and rested on all of them and they were suddenly able to speak in languages they had never learned. You know, it's at this point that Peter gets up and preaches a sermon about what was taking place. About the Spirit's power and the prophecies of the Old Testament that spoke of this moment and of the Messiah that they pointed to. He told of Jesus being sent by God, preaching and teaching and doing miraculous signs and wonders. He went on to explain that the crowd, the ones, were the ones who put him to death. Peter's message was so powerful that the crowd was convinced of their guilt and they interrupted his sermon, crying out, What? can we do? Peter says something incredible in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Listen to his reply. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Thus the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, introduced himself on Pentecost in two ways. The first way the Spirit was revealed was in an in-your-face, dramatic, attention-getting show of force and power through the Apostles. This was a one-time event to get the attention of the crowd. The second way the Spirit was introduced was flash, less flashy. Peter said, The Spirit was God's gift to those who believed, repented, and were baptized into Christ. This gift, the Spirit of God, was God's mark on us. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14 told us this when it says, Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, 
the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You see, the Holy Spirit is God's presence inside of us as Christians. He marks us as belonging to God. And God's Spirit inside us is a promise from God that He will never leave us or forsake us because He's always with us, inside us. He goes everywhere we go. In other words, God literally moves with us as we go to work, as we stay home, as we play, as we watch TV or read a book, as we drive down the road. And when we lay down at night to sleep and get up in the morning, the Bible tells us he's there all the time. You know, apparently the Old Testament saints didn't have the spirit in their lives like we do. You know, I say that because this promise of the spirit's presence was only for us. Don't believe me? Look at what John chapter 7 verse 38 and 39 says. Who believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So, God gave you and me a promise that no one in the Old Testament had. When you and I believe in Jesus and obey him in repenting and being baptized into him, we are filled with the Spirit of God. The second promise was this, the promise of power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his apostles the following, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That power was displayed when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles with the sound of a rushing wind and flames as a fire. You know, that didn't happen to everybody else. Let me suggest that this was God's, if you will, light and sound show for the audience. But the power of God's Spirit that you and I have in us, though it's a little less showy, let me suggest that it is just as dynamic. Paul wrote in Ephesians 3.16, in speaking to the Ephesian church, that he prayed that God would strengthen them with power through His Spirit in their inner being. Why would he do that? Well, look down at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, because God was, quote, able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. In other words, God's spirit inside of us strengthens us. He is able to do more for us than we could ever ask or even imagine. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, we're told that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. You see, God's spirit enables us to be filled with with God's kind of power, to be filled with His kind of discipline, and to be filled with His kind of love for others. Simply put, God's Spirit gets inside of me. Then He begins to tinker with me. He changes me into what God wants me to be. He molds me into the image of God, and as He shapes and molds and changes me, I begin to reflect the God who gave me that spirit 
to begin with. You know, that's why in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we're told that once they were filled with God's Spirit, that we should begin to show some very special fruit. Look at what it says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You see, without God's Spirit, you and I can't show God's kind love, joy, and peace to others. But wait a minute. Haven't you ever seen a non-Christian who was a loving person? Of course you have. So, if people can be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, etc., without God's Spirit inside of them, one could easily ask the question, why do I need God's Spirit to help me show those traits? Well, allow me to illustrate it this way. You all know what a car with a four-cylinder engine is, right? Now, let's say I own a four-cylinder vehicle and I want to pack it full of goodies to take on a trip with the family to the lake. Will it get me there? Sure, of course it will. Now, suppose I want to take it on a trip to California. Will that four-cylinder car get me to my destination? Sure, of course it will. That little four-cylinder car will take all kinds of places. But there's not much power under that hood, is there? I mean, have you ever tried to pass someone up in a four-cylinder car? It's not very easy, is it? If you want to pull anything of any consequence or have significant pickup and go, you are going to be disappointed. Why? Well, because it's an underpowered vehicle that was created just to help you save gas. But you know, nowadays, you can take that same car and you can take out the engine and drop a V8 engine into that car and all of a sudden, it's a lot more powerful. It's a lot faster. You know, essentially, that's what Christ's Spirit does inside of us. He takes our four-cylinder lives and replaces that engine with one that has more pickup and go. That's what the Spirit of Christ does inside of you and me. So, Let's summarize what we have learned so far this morning. We've learned so far that Jesus promised his spirit. It's the promise that will never be forsaken because he lives in us. And second, we learned that Jesus promised his power. It's the promise that we will never be feeble as long as he lives in us, through us. And that spirit and the power he gives us is all we need in this world. That is, until Jesus fulfills his third promise. And what is that third promise? The third promise is the promise of Jesus' return. You know, that promise is that he's going to return. And he's going to come back for us. He's going to take us with him to a better place, a better world. Acts chapter 1, 11 tells us that as Jesus descended into heaven, two angels appeared to the apostles and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. You see, as Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 4, 14, verses 1 to 3, one of my favorite texts, do not let your hearts be troubled. 
Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now, let me suggest that this is an even better promise than the first two. Jesus has promised us His Spirit and He's promised us power through that Spirit. But Jesus promised that He would return is a better promise than those other two promises could ever be. Now, you might ask, Pastor Eddie, how can you say that? Well, simple. It is a better promise because even if I have God's Spirit inside of me all my life, and even if I have the power of God just oozing out of me, if Jesus doesn't come back for me when I die, I'll stay dead. If Jesus doesn't come back for me, the grave will be my final resting place. If Jesus doesn't come back for me, then this is as good as it gets. You see, if Jesus doesn't come back for us, there will no be resurrection of the dead. But oh, He is coming back. 1 Peter 3 9 to 14 tells us so when it says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Church family, Jesus will come back soon. Why? Because He promised He would. In closing, I'd like to share with you a story that I believe greatly illustrates this point. The year was 1988 in the country of Armenia. A man named Samuel squatted beside his son, Armand, as he was about to go to school that day, and he spoke this promise to Armand. Have a good day at school, and remember, no matter what, I'll always be there for you. They hugged, and the boy ran off to school. Hours later, a powerful earthquake rocked the area. The radio announced that there were thousands of casualties and Samuel could get no confirmation about his son from anyone. So he did what any father would do. He grabbed his coat and headed for the schoolyard. And there, before his eyes, he saw his young boy's school, nothing more than a pile of rubble. Other parents were standing around crying, but not Samuel. He found the place where Armand's classroom used to be and began slowly but surely pulling a broken beam off the pile of rubble. He then grabbed a rock and put it to the side and then grabbed another one. One of the parents looking asked, what are you doing Samuel? I'm digging for my son, Samuel answered. The man then said, you're just going to make things worse. The building is unstable. As he tried to pull Samuel away from his work, but Samuel just kept working. He picked up a beam and pushed it out of the way. When he heard a faint cry, Help! Help! Samuel listened, but didn't hear anything again. Then he heard a muffled voice, Papa. Samuel began to big, big ferociously. Finally, he could see his son. Come on out, son, he said with relief. 
But his son said, no, Papa, let the other kids come out first because I know you'll get me. Child after child emerged until finally little Armand appeared. Samuel took him in his arms and his son said to him, I told the other kids not to worry because you promised me that you'd always be there for me. You know, in all, 14 children were rescued from their tomb and all because a father came back for his child. Church family, on that final day, there will be a loud command, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the good news is that millions will rise from their tomb, resurrected from death, all because of the promise that Jesus made that he will come back soon for his children. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we live in tumultuous times. Uncertainty is all around us. And I thank you that in those moments, Lord, whether it be through a hymn or through a text or through a friend, that you remind us that we can stand on the promises of God. Lord, this week, as we go to and fro, or as we stay in our home, isolated from others, Lord, I pray that you would remind us of your promises. Give us the strength we need to stand on those promises, I pray. May all God's children say, Amen.